Hello everyone, now in this series of videos we're going to be taking a look at a deep dive into the Mooney 201, also known as the Mooney 20J. Uh, this particular set of videos was commissioned by the 43rd Flying Club, which is a group based out of the airport that we're presently at, this is Hartford Brainerd, basically as a way to help them out with the uh, new aircraft that they're achieving. But I'm going to be releasing it on the regular channel too, so you can kind of see going a little bit more in depth with something. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, uh, sitting down in this plane, uh, our first video is going to be dedicated to just showing you kind of the interior, kind of walking through a couple of the different pieces. The later videos are going to get into things such as pre-flight, uh, control, normal takeoffs, dealing with things like cruising, dealing with things with like, different emergencies and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get started with just the overview of this aircraft. So this aircraft is a single engine airplane. It's uh, powered by a light combing. That's an IO360 up in the front seat. And it's a uh, fuel injected airplane. And if you take a look at it from the top, you probably notice a couple interesting details right away. Uh, the first one, of course, if you notice, we have a forward sweep on the wings. The wings themselves, as you can see, are very, very, very flat. Uh, they kind of remind me of something to be on a P-51, maximizing laminar flow. And if you look at the tail, it's like, hmm, now why is it that this looks just like this? Ah, because they stamped it all together. So one of the interesting things about the tail is most people would think it would be a stabilator, but it's actually a completely conventional in this particular case with an elevator. This thing needs a lot of trim, as you'll find out. The other thing we notice, too, is the uh, uh, elevator itself is perfectly lined up with this, meaning the airflow coming off the propeller is going to have a big impact on the controllability of this aircraft. Another thing you're going to notice right away is we are a retractable landing gear airplane, which as you can see, the clearance between the propeller and the ground is not terribly great. And looking at the front little landing gear itself, there's not really a lot going on with it. So you have to be kind of mindful of that. We also have this funky little hatch in the front, which we'll deal with a little later on. It's a ram air inlet. It's a reverse car in my mind. Big old landing light. And I notice we have no beacon light anywhere in this one, which is sort of disappointing. But hey, we have strobe, so it isn't all bad. So let's talk about some of the uh, things we need to know about this plane. Uh, first things first, uh, lengthwise, our aircraft is just a tiny bit over 36 feet. Those of you familiar with the Archer and the uh, Skylane already know that our, they're basically it's a standard wingspan for aircraft of this size. Now, stubby-wise, we're a little on the short side. We're only 24 feet long, meaning we don't really have a large moment between up where we're sitting versus where the actual elevator itself is. So this elevator, like I said, in general, is not going to have as much response as you're probably used to in other aircraft that are similar to it. So as far as other things we need to be thinking about in this aircraft, uh, we have a bunch of different limitations that we need to be uh, paying attention to. Our never exceed speed, if I come down to our airspeed indicator right here, is sitting here high at 198 knots indicated. Uh, that's an incredibly excessive. It's almost double the maneuvering speed on this one. Our structural cruising speed is uh, sitting down here at 176 knots. Our maneuvering speed, of course, is completely dependent on how much weight we're carrying. This is not a very big airplane. Like, I mean, you can theoretically carry some BAA in the back seat, but if you're going to do so, you probably probably have to uh, fold them in half or like, you know, stick them and like wrap them up like some like timber or something like that. So obviously it is a tight fit in this particular aircraft. Maneuvering speed ranges from 97 on the light end, all the way up to 116 knots indicated, depending on what you're doing in that particular case. Our flaps, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, we have one of the classic flap handles here. This one, uh, I've flown a 172Ks and ends, and it's the same style where you have to press and hold it to make it do what it wants to do. There's no mechanical flap lever or anything like that. So you have to be mindful of that. The maximum speed of which you can play with the flaps or have them extended is 115 knots indicated. Landing gear, uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we are retractable landing gear aircraft, and it's a little weird because you can put the gear down as much as 132 knots indicated. You can even leave them hanging off the bottom of the plane at 132 knots indicated. However, you cannot let the gear retract at any speed higher than 107 knots indicated. Now you're probably wondering what's the deal with that? It has to do with the doors. Uh, basically you're going to put them in a nasty spot and it's going to cause theoretically some damage if you try to do that. So when we do get airborne with this plane, one thing we have to do is get rid of the gears at a reasonable amount of time, unless you intend to be doing pattern work or something like that, in which case you could probably leave them down without any untoward effects or anything along those lines. Another interesting limitation speed-wise is this little window right here. This is a little pilot's window. Um, we're not supposed to have this thing open faster than 130. Um, I don't think we can get sucked out through it, but it's probably not so good to do it as well. Also limitations, if you take a look at our airspeed dial here, our lower speed here for a flap operating range, you can see is pretty darn slow at 55 indicated. Our green arc here starts up here at 63 indicated. And if you follow this all the way around, we already took a look at the 115 for the flaps, and the top of our green arc is 176. Now you probably 
will be going, wow, this thing must be pretty quick. If you can, green arc is 176. Yeah, you can get 176, especially in a descent. One of the things that makes this plane sort of challenging to operate is the fact that the aircraft itself, it, it wants to go fast. And it's very difficult to keep it from going too fast, especially if you're trying to go down. But we'll take a look at that problem a little bit later on. Now, the engine itself, I'm going to go poke, poke over here where we have our two different instruments here. Obviously, this is our manifold pressure. And here's our tachometer for RPM. It has a yellow arc that goes between 1500 and it looks about 1950, I believe is the upper limit here. This is the please don't put the engine into this RPM range range. Now you're sitting there going, well, the only way you could do that is if you're reducing power in some kind of descent or something. Yeah, it also means when you're coming in for a landing, getting into this range is very, very easy to do if you get too slow or you're a little too aggressive with the actual throttle itself. You can go under safely and you can certainly go over safely, but this is considered a no zone and it's considered a caution. It's not even a warning. This is like something bad could happen with the engine kind of caution. So you do want to be mindful of this range uh, when you're operating with it. The engine itself is 200 horsepower, but we do have this little tiny ram air handle, which like I said, it's just reverse carburetor heat. If you think of it like reverse carburetor heat, it'll make more sense, but we'll talk about that a little later on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to work our way through all the different instrumentation and just kind of get you comfortable with where the different handles and stuff like that are. Starting in the upper left here, we have our good old-fashioned our thermometer. I keep in mind this one will be a little different than the uh, Mooney that we've scooped up here. Pretty standard. It's going to tell you everything in Fahrenheit and Celsius. We have an ammeter. Obviously, if I go over here and I pop on, I'll make this for you. I'll go away, click this on. You can see we're discharging. If you do something silly like pop on the landing light, you can see that thing discharge even more aggressively. So obviously, you want to be kind of mindful of that. Now, obviously, if it's not going the other way when the alternator is running, notice by by the way, we don't have an alternator switch, but that could be bad news as well. So we have our clock. It's a good old-fashioned 12 day. Obviously, it's a little different than the real plane. You have the place where the key goes. Pretty straightforward. We have right and left both start. Pretty straightforward. This little uh, handy doodad thing is uh, left over from probably the 1980s or 70s where it came from. You're probably going to want to be plugging your regular headphones into these little slots right here. Coming up on this side, we have an instrument of all the critical instrument indicators at this particular position. We have our two fuel tanks. So we have our very, very large fuel tanks in this particular aircraft. Uh, we'll take a look at that a little bit later on. But again, the thing you have to remember is that our total fuel in this one is right around 64 gallons usable. However, in the aircraft that the 43rd purchased that particular year, they actually have extended range tanks, which gives you an even more massive capability of traveling. I think it's you almost 90 gallons, but don't quote me on that. This particular version that we're looking on here in X-Plane only has the 64 gallons max. So don't worry about it too much. So you have a bunch of standard instruments as far as things in here goes. We have our attitude indicator that's a vacuum instrument. If you need to worry about suction, we've got a little gauge here. Now we do not have an auxiliary vacuum pump like we do on the Archer. So just kind of be mindful of that. So we're going to to the right, we have our altimeter. Uh, this is a pretty standard one. You get the shorthand, you get the longhand, and you get the really stubby shorthand. Obviously, if you're at the little stubby shorthand, um, woo, well, getting some altitude today. We have our two VR receivers, an ADF receiver. Swing it down to the bottom. We have a turn coordinator, which is our DC instrument. On the aircraft that the 43rd purchased, I believe this HSI may be electric and not vacuum, but in this particular version, this one is an electric one, so this can be different. Moving to the right, we have a vertical speed indicator. Notice with this one, we only go up to 2,000 feet per minute up or down. The reason for that is, uh, believe it or not, even though we're 200 horsepower and we're very, very not draggy, it doesn't necessarily have ridiculous climb capabilities. It's certainly possible to go the other way with it, as you'll see. Coming down here, we have our switches. So we have our master switch. And notice it's a combination all in one button. We have our avionics. We have our fuel pump switch. The fuel pump in this aircraft is a little different. It's uh, especially coming from the Archer. It's going to be used at different times, and it's going to be used in emergencies differently as well. So we in here, we have our strobe light. Like I said, we have no beacon light. Navigation, landing. Uh, we have the P2 heat, and we have the electric elevator trim switch. Uh, generally, when you're going to turn this one on, you're probably going to turn that one on at the same time. The trim of this aircraft is uh, pretty straightforward. It's actually in two different spots. First spot, you have this little thing that looks kind of like a uh, saw blade sitting there between your legs right there. And you also, of course, have electric trim. So if I actually were to go ahead and pop on the yoke real fast, there we go. You can see we've got the big old fat switch right there. Again, this is a <laughs> very cute little yoke that they're kind of hanging off. Another nice thing about the trim is uh, sitting over here on the left, there's actually a little gauge here that will indicate exactly what your current trim position is, which is super handy. We also have, of course, a little flaps cage as well. Continuing along, we'll kind of swing back up for the top. We have our landing gear handle. We also have the safety bypass handle. Oh, that's going to be very, very, very critical depending on what's broken. And again, we'll deal with that when we talk about emergencies. Swinging to the middle, we have our enunciator panel. If we wanted to, we could turn on the battery real quick and press the test button. It lights up like a tree. We've got area now. We've got high voltage. We've got all of our typical warnings as you'd expect there. And the little ram air, which like I said, it's got that little orange light to let you know. 
We have an audio panel. Again, this could be a little bit different than the one that they actually purchased. But again, you can control your intercom volume here. Standard navigation radio, nothing too crazy. Uh, this is a much, much older common nav radio. This one has the old memory buttons where you dial the frequency and press and hold the memory button so it remembers it, kind of like an old radio kind of a thing. We have our handy dandy. This is a Garmin, uh, pretty straightforward. It's a transponder. I think you're familiar with one of these. DME, like I said, this will probably be a little different than the plane itself. And then we have a much more advanced autopilot than the one that you're actually going to see on the physical plane. Uh, the nice thing about this autopilot is we do have an altitude arm, so we can actually pre-program the altitude, and it will achieve that altitude for us and actually lock onto it, which is awesome. Coming down from there, we have three different handles. Uh, we have the black one, which is our throttle, the blue one, which is our prop, and of course the mixture handle, which is a big uh, chunky red handle right here. We are a fuel-injected engine, so startup is a little weird on this one. Coming down, I don't like this arrangement in the slightest, but uh, you gotta do what you gotta do. Up here is the Ram air control. Now this aircraft has reverse carb heat. That's what I like to call it. It doesn't call that in the manual, but that's what it is. So what's gonna happen is if I pull this handle back, you're gonna open up a door directly underneath the propeller, which is gonna allow air to basically bypass the filter and go right into the engine. The effect of which it's gonna give you something like uh, six more horsepower if you're at full power. It's, it's, it's not much. Uh, keep in mind with this pushed in, you are using the air filter. So the rules on this is kind of interesting, but you never know when you're gonna need that power. Parking brake is located right here. Like I said, why would you put that right next to something important? To the right of that, we have our cow flaps lever. On this particular aircraft, the cow flaps are open if you pull this out. Coming down below that, uh, we have some nice comfort features here. We have the cabin vent, we have the defroster, and we have the cabin heat. You don't want to get these two confused with each other. Like I said, I'm not thrilled with the fact that they're not all this different sizes or different shapes or have like little things I have to click past. Another thing you're going to see when you move right to the right is our trim indicator for elevator trim, as well as our flap indicator. One thing you're going to notice right away is we have a takeoff flap setting on this aircraft. Now remember, this is a momentary switch. This isn't click, click, click like it is on a 182. You have to actually dial it in and hold it in order to get them to go up and down. Even weirder, however, is full flaps on this is 33 degrees. It's a little strange. But one of the things I like is when you're setting up for flaps for takeoff, you just make sure the two lines basically line up with each other, and then you know that you're going to be ready for takeoff. Popping over on this side, we have our ELT, pretty straightforward. The up position is going to be on, the down position is going to be arm. This particular one has a GNS 430. Uh, we're not going to have a GNS 430. I imagine it's going to be a different device. Coming down from that, we have an ADF, which I doubt we have an ADF in the actual plane, but it is there if you need it. We have the all critical instrument panel lighting. Uh, it's worth noting you have two different types of lighting here. You have the instruments themselves and then you have the panel. So if you want to think about this as kind of, uh, what do you want to call this? A spotlight? And if you want to think this is kind of like local lights, it's uh, pretty good stuff, especially at night flying. On the right, uh, we have an EGT sensor. It's got one of those little needles to make it a little bit easier to identify where your peak. Uh, leaning this aircraft, the book recommends you're actually leaning it by the process of sending EGT where you need to go. Obviously, you're not going to be touching that too much if you're flying low, but it is still nice to know. We have a manifold pressure gauge, and we also have our tachometer butter with that uh, dreaded little yellow zone there. Like I said, the aircraft is not hard to fly. You just have to pay more attention to the actual aircraft when you're operating it in order to be safe. To the right of that, we have our good old-fashioned bus bar with all of our good uh, circuit breakers. This is an older model of this aircraft as far as how physically this 3D model you're looking at now. To the right of that, of course, uh, we have a fire extinguisher on the floor. We have a lovely do not slam door. This one's a pretty straightforward door. You pull it back and it pops open. Notice, uh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and close this one up real fast. Unlike the Archer, we do not have the overhead click here. Well, we're just going to be snapping this thing back and pushing that sucker open to get it to actually go. It's worth noting that the seats themselves, again, depending on the particular model of this, are really handy because you can do things like that and fold them over. So if you wanted to, you could have, um, well, I guess you could kind of lie down. <laughs> I don't know that I'd recommend it, but you certainly could give it a shot, kind of a thing like that. A couple other things we're going to see inside the cockpit here, and we'll finish up our familiarization. The first one down here is our fuel drain. Uh, this is a little weird. On this particular aircraft, uh, we have our left-right fuel selector, but we also have the ability to actually tug this thing and eject fuel from whatever selector. When we're doing the actual kind of pre-flight components, one of the steps is going to be doing one of these, clink, and actually pulling that open to make a big mess on the ground underneath us. Another very, 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 very important piece of equipment is this guy right here. Uh, this is basically going to allow us to release the landing gear in an emergency. One of the things that makes this aircraft a little dangerous is its retractable landing gear. If for some reason we uh, lose the ability to send them down, we've got to have a way that we can. And it's a bit of a process, but we'll take a look at that during the emergencies. Definitely something you're going to want to be familiar with. It's also something you want to make sure is disengaged so you don't have any issues. And of course, one very critical piece of equipment is right here. Uh, this allows you to take your old gum and uh, wrap it up in the wrapper and shove it in here and somebody else can discover it and get it all nice and sticky later on. 
A couple other things we'll take a quick look at, and we'll finish this up video up here. Let me go and reset my head back to the center here. We have our good old-fashioned a whiskey compass on this one. This particular aircraft uh, does not have a self-centering HSI. It is not a slaved HSI, I should say. It is conventional. So what you're actually going to have to do is you have to push this in, and you have to crank it to make sure these two numbers actually agree with each other. That's unfortunate, but it's not, not the end of the world or anything like that. Floating down the wing here. Our actual baggage compartment is accessed by this little place right here. You can pop that sucker open. You have a hat rack, which is good to about 45, 50. I'm not going to get, I don't want to guess here, but it's a not too, too many pounds, but a little, of course, you have a little tow bar and everything like that. A couple little duffels and stuff back here. Like I said, not the biggest thing. This is also, interestingly enough, considered to be an emergency exit. So if you actually take a look here, it's an auxiliary, not emergency, auxiliary exit. So again, it's a bit of a process. And I don't know how much of a fan I'm going to be to try to climb over this to get out here. And, you know, there's nowhere to really put your feet. Uh, that, that's just going to be messy. And the last thing we're going to take a look at, and then we'll go ahead and call this video to close, is come up to the front seat powered by Loco Wing. Whoop. You can go ahead and uh, take a look at the oil if you need to. Uh, this one's a six quarter, but like I said, we'll take it a little bit later on. Other than that, like I said, this was just a quick familiarization of the different components of the aircraft. Uh, just kind of take a look around it. It's fairly conventional. It's, I don't know, I find that the black's a little drab in my opinion. And uh, one thing that I will say, and you probably noticed this already, is the fact this is a small plane. You know, if I come down here, you're going to notice that the seats, let me move my leg here, are on the floor. There's no gap. Oh, I should say there is a gap, but I think that's the person who modeled the 3D here. Didn't do a solid job on it, but there's very, very little room. So when you're sitting in this aircraft, it's kind of important that you realize there's not a lot of room up. There's not going to be a lot of room left or right. It's just kind of one of those things to think about. Other than that, in the next video, we'll take a look at doing the pre-flight process, starting this thing up, and uh, later on, we'll take a look at takeoff. We'll take a look at landing and dealing with emergencies. Enjoy.